Hi Year 11, this is your Walking Talking Mock session for Paper 2. Before we begin the Walking Talking Mock, I just want to congratulate you on your brilliant attitude to your mock exams. Particularly in English language, I've been really impressed looking at that data, looking at the results and actually looking at the papers that I marked personally. I was really heartened by how hard you've worked. Congratulations is deserved for the following things. Our level of preparation and learning of your methods, for the most part you were learning them really well, you were sticking to your timings, and where students have made mistakes now, you know where those areas are to improve. In terms of attitude and approach, you were testing each other, you had your cue cards ready, everything that you were doing was absolutely brilliant. And the crucial skill of English, which is basically writing analytical peel paragraphs, we can see that that is something that's really, really solid for the majority of you. And that is what's going to carry you through in terms of success. It's quite easy for us to feel like at the moment there's a huge amount of work still to do, but you are absolutely at the same point as year 11 were last year, as year 11 were in the year previously, which is a really great achievement in a really difficult year for us this year. Okay, so as I say, this is the Walking Talking Mock for Paper 2. It's a session aimed to help you ace the questions that will secure the most marks and transform your grade questions 4 and 5 on Paper 2 English Language. We talk a lot in English about methods and I feel like sometimes some students might be thinking teachers talk all the time about methods but do they really work and actually in fact we can see from the achievement of students they absolutely do. Many students will have targets of fours I'm sure in this year group, many students have targets far higher but many students are aspiring for the kind of grades that these two students achieved and both of these students when I asked them in student voice two years ago were talking about the importance of their methods. Alfie said, you need to make sure that you know the marks and the methods for English language. Prioritise and get your timing right. Try and get more marks on those early questions. Time yourself, do the hard stuff. He got a six in language and a six in literature. Ryan, equally, targeted a four, got a seven and a nine. He said, majority of my time, I spent memorising the general structure and method for the exam questions and using past paper questions to build my confidence. So the important message is you can revise for English and these students are absolutely evidence of that fact. The methods that we teach you are designed to help you pick up all the marks that you deserve and all the marks from showing off the skills that the examiners want to see at each question in the paper. OK, so earlier on we talked about heavy hitters and this is what this session is all about. The reason why we talk about heavy hitters is because of the amount of marks that these two questions, question four and question five, are worth. So we've got questions one, two and three on the paper which are worth 24 marks. But questions four and five, the writer's viewpoint and perspective question where we're comparing the writer's perspective and the question five, the writing with a strong point of view, that one is worth 56 marks combined. So it's really important that we keep up the stamina all the way through the paper and that we get onto those questions and we do those questions justice. Otherwise, it's really going to negatively affect our mark. So what happens when you miss a heavy hitter? I'm going to show you some real examples of students in our school who have been negatively affected in their overall grade by missing those questions four or five or not completing them in full. So student A here from 2019 just about got a grade six. However, they only got three out of 16 marks on that first heavy hitter, question four, that comparison of the writer's viewpoints, they wrote very little. And so therefore, they only got grade six, despite the fact that those questions they attempted in full showed they were working at top grade seven level overall. It really negatively affected their grade by more than a grade overall. For student B, theirs was even worse. So they achieved a grade four. It's still a pass, but it doesn't do them justice in terms of what they could have achieved. They only got 10 out of 40 marks for question five, the writing question. For those questions they attempted in full, questions one, two, three, and four, section A, they actually got a grade eight on section A. And unfortunately, because section B is worth half of the marks, they only got a four. So it's important that we see the reality of what happens if we don't work on these questions and make sure that we do our very best on them. And so on to timing, some really important messages here. Timing is essential to achieving your target grade. If you run out of time or miss a question, you could lose a whole grade, particularly if it's question four or question five. And the hardest lesson for you here is, if you do not answer question four and five, you simply will not pass. The best you can hope for is probably a grade one if you do that. Remember, timing is essential and you need to make sure that you leave about an hour and five minutes for question four and question five. 
So I would actually, during that time where they're waiting to begin the paper, actually look at the clock and think, right, okay, we're gonna start at 9.05, what time will it be in an hour and five minutes so that I know at that point I need to be starting question four. And that will mean that you are completing all of the questions that you need to and getting all the marks that are available. Question four is the second to last question. It's the, probably the most challenging question in section A, in your reading section. And this is why I'd always advise you to do it question one to question four, because then it helps you to build up the skills. So question four will always be phrased like this. For this question, you need to refer to the whole of source A together with the whole of source B. So it always wants you to quote from both. It always asks you to compare how the writers convey their different experiences on something. It might be on the extreme weather conditions like this one. It might be their perspective on festivals. It might be their perspectives and feelings towards the elephants, as in the Orwell one that we looked at for the mock exam. But it also gives you a few jumping off points. Compare their different perspectives. Compare the methods they use. Support your response with references to both texts. Remember to quote from both texts. If you only quote from one, you're going to cap your result at about level two. And that means, therefore, that there is no way that you are going to achieve a top mark on this question. So whole of source A together with source B. Telling you you can quote from anywhere. You don't have to use quotations from all the way across the source, but you can use the entirety of the source to select from. It's a language question in disguise, just the same as question four on paper one. It's about methods. How does the writer use devices to present that perspective, that viewpoint, on the issue that they're writing about. And perspectives just means viewpoint, thoughts, feelings. And we also need to find, of course, the key word. The key word here is the extreme weather conditions. Um, in the mock paper, it was attitudes towards the elephants. And we're gonna keep using that all the way through our answer to make sure that that is the steer of your answer, that you're not coming away from the key word in the question and talking about things that aren't relevant. If we're talking about perspectives, we're basically talking about points of view, thoughts, feelings, emotions, attitudes. And so crucially, what we want to be talking about is words like this. So this is your emotion wheel. You might remember this from um, revision previously. You might have used this earlier when we were talking in terms of using great vocabulary and writing. And this emotion wheel is actually multifunctional. It's really good in terms of helping you with this question, but it's also brilliant in terms of practicing writing and using great vocabulary. So in the center, it's got the simple words and then these work outwards to become more complex. So a word like anger becomes aggressive, frustrated, critical, threatened, becomes more complex as we move outwards on the circle, resentful, violated, provoked, infuriated. So this is really useful. And the emotion wheel can help you discuss viewpoints and perspectives, the writer's feelings. The writer of source A feels skeptical and anxious while attending Glastonbury Festival. However, the writer in source B feels overjoyed and excited to be going to Greenwich Fair. You might remember that from the paper that was on festivals with Day at Glastonbury Festival and Dickens at the fair in Greenwich. So this is really useful and I would absolutely encourage you when you're practicing to use this initially. Once you get confident, you can then take it away. And obviously it won't be there in the exam, but this really hope, helps to hone you in on the writer's thoughts and the writer's feelings. The first thing I would always do for this question, once I've found those keywords in the question, is to identify the overall view or perspective or feelings of either writer first and to make a note at the top of each insert. So how does the writer in source A feel? How does the writer in source B feel? What do they think? What does source B think? This is all about perspective. So for the one that we were talking about before, Glastonbury and Greenwich Fair, which all of you did in preparation for the mock exams, Day feels sceptical. She feels irritated by the prospect of going to the festival. She feels disgusted by the conditions at Glastonbury. But by the end, she feels eventually charmed by the festival. She starts to think it could actually be a nice, pleasant thing. Dickens, on the other hand, from reading it, we know he feels overall excited, joyful, proud, happy, even though it's quite chaotic. And so if I've got these words just jotted at the top, I can then use them to knit together my response. I can link together quotations and ideas and I can use these words to focus on the writer's perspective. You don't need to have this many words, it might just be two or three, but focusing in on the overall feeling or perspective of the writer allows you to then look for relevant evidence that links to those ideas. 
We're going to look at the ones that you've been given today now. So on your yellow sheets, you will find two sources. These are an example for paper two, section A. One of them is 21st century nonfiction, and it is about Mike Ashley, the owner of Sports Direct, running his business like a Victorian warehouse, not treating his um, workers very well. And then the other source is 19th century nonfiction. The other source is always older. It's always an older text, like a 19th century one. And this is an account of a Victorian warehouse from a man who visited one in the 1800s. Now, I'm going to tell you for this one, the overall viewpoint or perspective, because we're not going to have time to read the entire source. Instead, we're going to read just some short sections and pick out some evidence. So on these two, if you read the whole source, and of course you can do it at your leisure afterwards, Source A, the writer feels disgust at the conditions at Sports Direct. He thinks it's unfair, it's corrupt, it's unacceptable, it's demoralising, meaning that the actions of Mike Ashley and the owner of Sports Direct makes his workers feel worthless, makes them feel unhappy. Okay, so that's how the writer presents the issue. He feels disgust, he feels it's unfair, he feels it's corrupt. In the other one, the writer presents the idea of disgust. He feels disgusted equally by the conditions. He thinks they're appalling. He suggests that it's dehumanising the people. It's treating them almost more like animals than humans. Um, it's again unacceptable. The conditions he feels are completely squalid, which just means really dirty. He feels that it's just the most appalling place to be. Now, what we're going to do, you need to be led by language devices. But remember, you do not need to refer to the whole of the sources. It says you can, but you don't have to refer to the whole of the sources. May, most of your quotations might come from single sections in the text. So I'm going to direct you towards now particular sections in the text so that you can have a go at identifying some language devices and picking out the quotations that you would use that show that is the writer's perspective. And remember, we need methods. So. If we think, OK, if I had to select just one paragraph section of the text to sum up the experience view of the writer in source A or the experience and view of the writer in source B, which would it be? Be led by devices, find devices first and then think, OK, well, what does that suggest about the perspective? Because I know some of you really struggle with them finding devices. So sometimes if we go, oh, well, there's a metaphor there, we can think about, right, but what does that metaphor suggest? about the thoughts and feelings of the writer, rather than trying to do it the other way, where we select a great quotation about the thoughts and feelings of the writer, but then we spend 10 minutes trying to think what device it is and really struggling to find one. So be led by your devices. So I'm gonna zero us in now on just one part of the text. It could be that you find all of your evidence for this question in a single paragraph, and you don't need to worry about that. This is the area I want you to have a look at on your resource, okay? We've got lines 1 to 12 and lines 1 to 13. The one on the left hand side is the first source, the one about Sports Direct. The one on the right hand side is um, the one from the 19th century text. Now, because we're working between those lines, you can even do that boxing off thing that we practice. Find lines 1 to 12 and 1 to 13 and just box them off because those are the parts only that I want you to look at for this task. OK, so we said the writer in source A presents Sports Direct as corrupt. He feels that the conditions are appalling. He feels that it's demoralising to the workers. There's something immoral, wrong in how Mike Ashley is behaving. Whereas in the other one, we said that the writer feels the conditions are appalling. People are dehumanised. It's squalid. It's awful. That's how he feels about it. So I want you to find two to three quotations from each text that show the writer's viewpoint. Be led by language, because remember, this is a language question in disguise. Try and find language devices as well. And if you can, remember to do that. Zoom in on a word. Find a smaller device within but pick, a, pick words that you can say really interesting things about. Remember, if you ever get stuck on this kind of task, you can always find semantic fields. Just find a linked group of words, a semantic field of suffering, for instance. You can always find emotive language, words that sound shocking or make you feel happy or sad or make you feel the trauma of other people. Um, verbs, there are always verbs, dynamic verbs to do with action, for instance. There are always adjectives. You can always fall back on imagery, 
imagery of suffering, for instance, if you don't want to select a single word. So we're going to pause there and I'll give you about five minutes or so to see what quotations you can find just within those lines for source A and just within those lines for source B. Okay, so some of the things that you might have identified, we'll just go through and give some of that feedback now. So, you might have noticed the simile. Mike Ashley has been running Sports Direct like a Victorian warehouse. Conveys the writer's feeling that this is corrupt. There is something awful and bad and shocking about this. And that's the writer's feeling, that it's almost historically awful. It's a way of working that people aren't used to nowadays. You might have noticed abstract nouns and emotive language, dignity or respect. He's saying it's without dignity or respect. Use of those abstract nouns, dignity, respect, emotive language. We empathise with that, don't we? And it really conveys the writer's sense of disgust. The metaphors, a crisis was looming, shone a light on work practices, emphasising the shocking nature of it, the way that this is built, the kind of tension that's simmering in the company and the way in which this has exploded and surprised and shocked everybody. You might talk about contrasts or juxtaposition, workers as commodities rather than human beings, um, closer to a Victorian warehouse than a modern reputable high street seller. So all of those ideas about how the writer believes this is dehumanising, this is immoral, um, this behaviour, treating his workers as commodities, like objects and things that are owned rather than human beings. Whereas in this one, we might have mentioned things like a semantic feel of poverty, revolting, dirty, empty, without boots, that emphasise the suffering of the people. The writer really empathises with them, really feels sorrow for them. Hyperbole, it's almost heartbreaking, that metaphor of heartbreak. The writer wants to really convey to you just how um, horrified and saddened he was by the conditions in the workhouse. The address terms, the inmates had not, the inmates, poor people, aged men and women. So we've got those address terms that almost dehumanise the people, the inmates, the poor people, aged men and women, referring to them as elderly. The sensory language, I could hear the complaints and see the tears. The writer seems almost traumatised by this experience, really saddened by what he's seen. So once I've got my evidence, what I can then do is I can then start to think about knitting this together into a response. So I've found some evidence in the previous slide and I'm going to start to think about how I put this together. We always want to start with statements of comparison at the beginning. Your teachers might refer these as, to, to these as sods, statements of difference, although sometimes they're statements of similarity as well, and that's absolutely fine. And we want to compare clearly at the start and end of each pair of statements, each pair of paragraphs. So we would say something like, the writer of source A feels while the writer of source B feels. The writer of source A feels disgust while the writer of source B feels shocked, for instance. The writer of source A presents this idea while the writer of source B presents this idea. You can say both writers feel, if you want to, both writers feel disgust in this case, don't they? However, source A is more like this, while source B is more like this. Sometimes there's kind of more subtle distinction. Yes, they both appear to be doing this, but this is slightly more distinct in this one compared to this one. At the end of your paragraphs, you're going to use a therefore stem and that therefore stem just reinforces your comparison. Therefore, source A is like this, whereas source B is like this. Therefore, source A is similar to source B because. Therefore, source A contrasts source B because. And every time the examiner sees these statements of similarity or these statements of comparison, you are getting marks. But if you struggle with using your therefore at the end and you always forget that step or you feel that you're short on time, just saying at the beginning, the writer of source A feels while the writer of source B feels and explaining it and then quoting from both and analysing quotes from both, that is plenty to get you the majority of the marks. So you get easily a five doing that method. So we want to sandwich each pair of paragraphs between a statement of difference or similarity and a therefore sentence at the end to sum that up. 
So effective comparison. The examiner wants to see comparing connectives. They want to see things like whereas, while, on the other hand, however, in contrast, similarly, in the same way. So for a grade five, grade six even, certainly for a grade four and a pass, those are gonna be plenty for you to be talking about comparison. For the higher grades, you want to be more critical, and that's where you might say, the writers of both source A and B think or feel this, so they both share this feeling. However, in source A, it's conveyed with a metaphor, while in source B, it's conveyed using this. Or, however, in source A, it's more a feeling of disgust, while in source B, it's more a feeling of sorrow. You might say, although both writers use a metaphor, this is used to present very different perspectives. So what you're doing is a slightly more tentative cross-reference. I describe this to my A-level students as same but different, different but the same. So you're kind of drawing more of a critical cross-reference comparison. They both share this, but in one it's like this, whereas in the other it's like this. And then the structure itself, you'll have seen this before. The writer in source A thinks, feels, or believes, whereas the writer in source B, that's my statement of difference or my statement of similarity. I analyse source A using devices, exploring the effect using my verbs of inference and verbs of effect. I pick out a micro quote or a smaller device and I analyse that. That's basically your peel, isn't it? In source A, we do appeal on source A. However, we then do appeal on source B before summing up with a therefore statement. Therefore, source A is like this, whereas source B is like this. And so you'd need to do that process twice, really, to get those marks. Two really clear comparisons of devices, how the writer uses things in either text, the writer's perspective in either text, twice is good, three times is even better. And that's what this little diagram shows you there. You want to do this once, twice, three times if you can. But twice is absolutely fine. Remember, you've got 20 minutes. Simply write as much as you can within that time. So this is an example. This is grade five. Grade five just compares. The writer in source A feels executives of Sports Direct have created unfair working conditions, while the writer in source B feels the workhouse conditions are dirty and unacceptable. In source A, the writer uses the metaphor, a crisis was looming to show the negative impact these working conditions were having. The verb looming, remember if you can use a smaller device there, please do. The verb looming shows the disaster that would occur for the executives and their workers if action wasn't taken. In contrast, I now go to source B. The writer in source B feels the conditions the workers face are cruel and unsuitable for humans. The writer uses a semantic feel of poverty, dirty, empty and revolting to show the horrible conditions they live and work in. The word revolting shows how disgusted he was. Sum up with a therefore and a final comparison. Therefore, source A shows the writer's disappointment the executives have acted badly, while source B shows how shocked the writer was by the filthy conditions of the workhouse. Now that is probably a five plus, becomes undoubtedly a six if that's sustained and you do that twice. Could even be inching towards a seven, actually, if you do that twice and you do that convincingly. Again, critical comparison example. This is where we do the same but different thing. Both writers are disgusted by the working conditions, but for different reasons. The writer in source A is disgusted the executives are exploiting the employees, forcing them to work under unfair contracts, while the writer in source B is disgusted by the squalor the poor are forced to work in while in the workhouse. Again, we analyse the device. This time it's a metaphor. On the other hand, we analyse the device in the other one, emotive adjectives. And again, we sum up with a therefore. Therefore, the writer of source A judges the executives and shows sympathy to the workers. However, the writer of source B truly empathises with the workhouse poor and feels their suffering. So all the time, both of those answers are focused on the thoughts and feelings of the writer and their analysing language and their comparing, which are the two, which are the three, sorry, main areas that you must be doing. OK, and again, consistently done, that will produce undoubtedly a nine. We're now going to think about section B, writing. 
And we're going to spend a bit more time now with you actually having a go at bits and pieces, having a try at planning things and writing things and seeing what we can produce in this time. So section B is writing to express a strong point of view. It will be in a specified form, a letter, a speech, an article, the text for a leaflet, something like that. Sometimes it might be something unusual like an essay. So I'm going to talk you through that as well today. The argue, persuade, explain, advise that's there at the bottom, those are your text purposes. So it will say you're writing to argue, you're writing to persuade people, you're writing to explain your point of view, for instance. You don't need to worry about that too much. It really is just about how forceful the um, arguments are being put across, really, the difference between an argument and a persuasion and an explanation of your opinion. We need to be the master of the mark scheme. You will have seen this frequently throughout your GCSE. This is the mark scheme summarized into effectively very short success criteria. This is what you need to include to be successful. So we need to be compelling, interesting from the beginning. We need to make sure that we are matching to the audience. We're aware of the audience. Vocabulary, you can see there is double weighted. We need to make sure we've got paragraphs, variety, including a one sentence paragraph. We want devices, similes, metaphors, personification, rhetorical questions, emotive language, triples, but we want those crafted for the maximum impact. We want discourse markers to link our writing together and to seamlessly link our paragraphs and to build our arguments. And in terms of accuracy, we want sentence variety, short sentences, longer sentences, sentences that open in different ways. We want to be as accurate as possible with spelling, but that is not the be all and end all of your overall accuracy mark. There are differing levels of kind of skill in terms of spelling and, and proficiency in terms of spelling that are credited on the mark scheme, but you're also being credited for all of these other things. But do try and spell as accurately as you can and check your work really carefully at the end. Punctuation is important. Accuracy with things like full stops, capital letters, apostrophes, but then equally crafting using punctuation, things like exclamation marks, semicolon, the ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. So we're going to be using those to craft as well as to be accurate. And standard English, no slang is the final one. So if I can master these skills, I can do brilliantly on this question. And actually knowing your strengths and weaknesses in these areas and pre-preparing for them in terms of your planning can really help you to unlock the higher marks here. We also need to think about the process we use when we plan and timing again here is absolutely essential. We're going to spend about 10 minutes, the examiners recommend, for planning, it might be slightly less. I find 10 minutes really means that I've got a really secure plan. In that five point plan, you're gonna make sure that you plan for the content, so the ideas, the structure using a five point plan. You're gonna think about devices, you're gonna think about vocabulary. Everything is gonna be absolutely bolted on and nothing left to chance. You're gonna make sure that you plan for those things to make sure they are in. This is your chance as a showcase of everything you can do. You're then gonna have about 30 minutes to write. And that is plenty of time to write with the depth and detail that you need in terms of the length that you're being asked to produce. It's not pages and pages and pages, 30 minutes only. Examiners also recommend, and it says this on your paper, take time to check and improve five to 10 minutes, however long you've got left at the end after that five to 10 and then 30 minutes. This is your chance to swap out boring vocabulary, make sure you've included a range of punctuation, discourse markers, check your paragraphing, check your um, spelling where possible, check you haven't missed any capital letters because the examiner can only judge you on what you've got there on that page. Don't leave anything to chance, leave yourself time to really check over it and make sure it's the best quality you can produce. You also need to think about your examiner. So how can you make it easier for them to reward you? How can you make a positive impact from that first line and leave your impression on them? What kind of things do they see straight away when they open up your paper? How can you leave them thinking that you are a brilliant writer? And there are many tricks that we can do here to make sure we pick up more marks. So what can the examiner see straight away? The examiner can see quite a lot, actually. The examiner can see straight away, first of all, whether you've planned. They want to see a plan and they know that the best pieces of writing come from a detailed plan. So that always starts them off thinking, this is a student who's probably crafted a really well-considered piece. They also look at the piece and think, well, how long is it? Have they waffled on for pages and pages? Have they written a crafted, shorter piece of maybe two to three pages? They can also see 
whether you paragraphed. They can see the variety of your paragraphs. They might even be able to see some discourse markers at the beginning. They can see if it's laid out like an article, like a speech, like a letter. So actually they can see an awful lot the second they open the paper and they're judging your work right from that first moment. And interestingly, the advice from examiners is actually that we should write around two to three sides. Three sides is probably the optimum. If you've got large handwriting, it may stretch to around four. But don't just write pages and pages and pages. We know that that means that it loses focus. Stop, plan, be structured and craft your piece to be the best it can be across those three pages. They can also see the paragraph structure straight away. Here you can see quite a varied paragraph structure. You can see something at the top that looks a little bit like a headline, for instance. For six or above, you want to have varied paragraphs, paragraphs that look interesting, paragraphs that are there for a purpose, maybe even a one sentence paragraph. So they can actually see quite a lot when they first open your paper. When you first start this question, the first thing you need to identify, what is the text type? Who is the audience I'm writing for? And what is the purpose of my writing? You can't start writing before you've identified those things or you won't be able to signpost the different aspects that you're trying to produce. It needs to look correct. It needs to sound correct. It needs to be tailored for the audience. So you must find that information. So here is an example. You're giving keywords in the statement to be addressed in your answer. This one says education is not just about which school you go to or what qualifications you gain. It is about what you learn from your experiences outside of school. So there's always say two to three ideas in that statement to give you as jumping off points. And actually in the mock, some people who were the most successful took the different ideas as different paragraph structures. They decided to write about different areas that were in the question. And that was clever, that helped to give you a structure. And it's designed to give you some ideas to think about and something to argue against. It tells you the text type, this one's a speech, means you need to directly engage and speak directly to an audience. And this is for school or college leavers day. So therefore your audience is year 11 students, possibly secondary audience of teachers are gonna be present there as well. But really you're talking to students and you're explaining what makes a good education? So that's a typical question. Remember, the people you are writing for cannot see that statement. So that statement is just for you to spark off your imagination. You certainly shouldn't begin by saying, yes, I agree with the statement, for instance. That's not helpful. It's just there for ideas. And so we're going to practice some of that now. And again, I'm going to ask teachers to pause me in just a moment, or if you're doing this at home, you can pause me for a minute to do this task. On these three examples here, I want you to identify, please, the text type, the audience and the purpose in the question. You can also identify some of the key words in the statement as well at the top if you want to. But the key things are find the text type, find the audience, find the purpose and underline or highlight those in the response. OK, now, believe it or not, the power of visualisation can really help you be successful in your writing. And what it can help us do is help us to picture the end product of what we want to produce. The same technique is used frequently in sports science and sports psychologists use this idea. There's a quotation here from a sports psychologist who works with players from Fulham and West Ham. And he talks about visualising the different stages that you need to go to and visualising that glorious end product. So we're going to do the same thing with our writing to visualise what should this type of writing look like on the page? So we visualise the different text types. One of them is a letter here. One of them is an article. One of them is an online article. I wonder if you can tell which one is which. And so the formal letter was the first one. We can see here some of the key aspects of a letter. Crucially, we've still got the very paragraphs, but crucially, we've got a sign off at the end, yours sincerely or yours faithfully. We've got the, your address at the top. You've got dear sir or madam, dear prime minister, whoever you're writing to, but it looks very different. For an article, we need to make sure we've got headlines in the mock exam. Some of us have got headlines, homework, helpful or hideous. And remember, we need a five point plan every time we write. And we're going to talk about what the five point plan entails 
in a little bit as well. But again, we can see that we've got varied sections, we've got varied paragraphs. We might have a subheading, you can see part way down there, we've got a subheading, but really the minimum that we're expecting is a headline, maybe a subheadline and varied paragraphs as normal. For an online article, might be an online article, I find it helpful to signpost at the top that we know this is an online article, just with a web address, just with a username, maybe. Um, certainly a date and a time can often indicate that this is something that would appear online. And again, same process, a five point plan in terms of putting this together. Writing is the same every time really in terms of the structure, but we need to signpost some key aspects to just show the examiner that I know the, set, the type of writing that I'm producing. Now, sometimes it might say, write a leaflet, write a speech, write an essay. If it's a leaflet, an examiner does not want you to be drawing columns and imagining how it would fold in and all of that kind of idea. Just write it as you would any other piece. It certainly doesn't need to look like a leaflet on the page. It might just have some headings, subheadings to divide it up and make it a bit more user-friendly for your audience. In terms of a speech, Again, you don't need a headline or anything like that. Just start to write, but acknowledge your audience. If it says essay, it's still asking you to present your argument. And actually, I don't think this is vastly different to an, uh, an article. It's probably still gonna have a title, title for your essay about how you feel about the issue that's being presented. And really, it's not about how you write. It's about how you write, sorry, not about what you write. The examiner is looking for your craft. They're not looking to nitpick and say, oh, hang on, I think that looks a bit more like a leaflet than a speech or more like an online article than an article. Really, the key thing is they want to see what you can do in terms of your showcase, in terms of your writing. So we use the same type of five point plan and we wow the examiner still with devices, vocabulary, craft, no matter what task we get. Please don't let curveballs like this throw you at all. You are great writers. It's the same no matter what. We need to match our writing to our audience and we can do that by signposting. So not only do we need to think about the different format of the articles and the letters and things, but we can see here on the right hand side there, we've got different audiences that we might accommodate with our language. Young people, head teacher, local MP, adults, things like that. And we can signpost these audiences through the language that we use. It will often say broadsheet readers. That's just signposting to you that this audience demands formal language, they're likely adults, educated adults, so we need to make sure that we accommodate them in the way that we're writing. And so you might use things like this. If you're writing to the head teacher, you might say things like, as the leader of our school community. If you're writing for Tarpoli students, you might say, we teens often. If you're writing for local residents, you might say, in our local area. As broadsheet readers, you might say something like, as educated readers, I'm sure you can understand. Or as a nation, we, because for a broadsheet, the audience is always nationwide across the country. And so let's have a look at actually practicing a question, generating some ideas. So if this was our question, the first step is always to come up with the best ideas we can. No one can have something for nothing. If people collect benefits, they should expect to have to complete some work in return. Write a blog for a news website in which you argue your point of view on this statement. So for this one, if you annotate along with me, please. We've got the keywords in the question. People can't have something for nothing. It's about benefits and the need for work or not. It's a blog but it's for a news website. So we need to make sure that it's kind of news based in its tone. It's gonna to be formal. Don't be fooled by thinking blog, it must be informal and you're arguing. So let's start by generating some ideas. Again, just about two minutes for you to think, what are some ideas we could have here to talk about in our writing? Because the first step, I would just do a mind map of ideas so we can then work that into a plan. Okay. So some of the ideas you might come up with, some people simply don't want to work. That could be an argument. Supporting the vulnerable. We need to support those who are disabled, medically unable to work, people who are carers. The benefit system is important for that. What about people who fall on hard times? What about voluntary work to keep benefits? Could that be something that means that everybody um, is able to stay within the, the kind of working community, even if they're job seeking? 
Low income jobs sometimes make benefits more rewarding than work. That can be an argument. What happens if you lose your job unexpectedly? We've learned from looking at the Sports Direct example, some people are on zero hours contracts. That means that they sometimes just don't have any hours to give them. And that means that if they don't work, they don't earn anything. And that can be a real challenge for people. So these are just some ideas. The beauty of doing a mind map at the beginning is these can make the focus of individual paragraphs in your essay. You might think, right, well, I want to talk about the importance of supporting the vulnerable in this paragraph and give some examples. I want to talk about the fact that some low income jobs barely make it worth working. I want to talk about what can happen if you fall on hard times or lose your job. So these can be kind of anchor points for your and so in the interest of thinking about what the examiner can see straight away when they first open your paper, the first thing they read, remember power openers are really important. I know you've practiced quite a few of these in lesson, but just a reminder to you, if you are struggling with these, probably the best power opener you can use, easiest one is something like picture the scene, the crowd is roaring, da -da -da, for instance, or otherwise you can attempt things like a subversion, you can start with the end, you can use an ironic opener. So you can have a bit of time to read these in your own time, but this is just a reminder to you of those things. Make sure you think about how you're going to open and equally think about how you're going to close. Often the best closing is cyclical, links in some way back to your opening scene. So, for instance, if you started with a picture of the scene, you might subvert that image and then say, so now picture the scene and you've changed that or whatever you've opened with, you might subvert. So, for instance, if you look at the top right there, I started with the words to camp or not to camp. That is the question. By the end of my article about festivals, I'm going to end with the words to camp or not to camp. There is no question. And so I'm going to do something cyclical that's clever that brings it back round to the start. Final thing that I want us to do then is to think about those engaging openings, the engaging conclusions, and to think about our overall five point plan. So you can do this in your own time, actually, the practice of the engaging opening and the engaging conclusion. But there is space there for you to think about, OK, what would my, be my engaging opening? And then how might I subvert that and return to that at the end? If you're stuck, you can use picture the scene. Otherwise, you can use any other kind of opener that you want to. OK, so this is our five point plan. What we're going to do is now practice using the five point plan for a planning example on a particular topic. You might just want to pause here with your teacher just to remind yourselves of what the different aspects of the five point plan are and where we can put those words into those spaces. OK, so this is a demonstration of that five part plan with some sentence starters and some ideas of how you might do this. This is one about celebrities and sportsmen and women being poor role models for young people. It's an article for a teenage magazine that argues for or against this point of view. So we start with an engaging opening, something to grab our reader straight away, something to show the examiner that you are being compelling right from the start. We can see this example here uses three rhetorical questions. Apologies there that the footballing references are not massively current. Um, but you could use a picture of the scene, you could use um, a subversion of a famous line, something like to be or not to be play or not to play, um, something like that. And then you're going to grab us right from the beginning. But you need to plan for that opener. What's going to be the most engaging way to start? Then we've got an overview of the issue. We introduce the issue we're talking about. So we're talking about footballers and their private lives here. This can be a good opportunity to get a semicolon in if we start with the topic and then we say we've all heard the stories about. That can be a good way of introducing the issue. We delve into detail by giving some examples, some specific anecdotes, stories, examples about people, might be examples about celebrities and sportsmen and women here who are good examples or bad examples. And I present both sides of the argument. Remember on the news when we heard about is a good opener for that. Then number four, I consider the wider issues within society that are linked to this idea. If you think about it as a nation, we admire the wrong role models. And then I might talk about, I don't know, we should instead respect doctors and uh, soldiers and people who work in frontline jobs that are challenging and her heroic. Um, and then finally, our engaging conclusion. This is where I want to be cyclical and return back to the beginning. So now picture the scene. So all in all, that kind of clean, succinct ending that draws it all together. Again, final thing then for us to do, using those ideas that we planned with earlier on, I want you to have a go at doing the five point plan. One of the things that many students I talk to 
felt would have really improved their overall mark. It is mentioned twice on the question. You are advised to plan your answer. Huge numbers I spoke to hadn't planned their answer and it had, had a real impact. So the final task here, if that is your question, the one that's on the screen, I want you to think about what would your engaging opening be? Your overview of the issue? What kind of issues would you want to talk about? What detail or example would you then delve into? What wider issues might you consider? And what would your engaging conclusion be? And just a couple of minutes now to think about, if that was my question about the benefits system, what would my plan be? You may have come up with some ideas like this. This is my example for you. A drop paragraph, my drop paragraph is going to describe a stereotypical family on benefits, one that's not an accurate representation at all. Senses, I'm going to mention laziness, I'm going to mention no desire to work, I'm really going to hyperbolize and exaggerate this awful version of this stereotypical image. And then going to subvert that by talking about the UK benefit system, the fact that everybody has an argument. I'm going to explain the main arguments on both sides and show that I understand the argument, but that I've got a clear point of view myself. I'm then going to delve into some examples where working might not be beneficial. For example, a working mother needs to earn £40,000 a year to place two children in nursery. Or I might give some examples about somebody who is disabled or somebody who's a young carer or something like that and therefore unable to work. I'm then going to discuss the wider importance of supporting vulnerable people, why we have a benefit system. And then finally, my engaging conclusion is going to subvert the earlier image. Paint a scene of a working parent barely able to make ends meet, counting the few pennies left. That idea of these people who are being lost by this system. And then I'm going to end with a rhetorical question just to make me hammer home my point and leave the examiner thinking about something positive about me. Discourse markers is another thing that some of you forgot to do in the mock. So this is just another reminder of some of that too. Um, these are also in your booklet, so you can go back to these, look over them. These are some that you can practice with. I would definitely have these on your plans as well. Naturally, obviously, clearly, nevertheless. And then the last thing for us really is just a final point on devices. We often think when we think persuasion, we need to use our forest. These devices that we've known since year seven. These are the seven standard tools of persuasion. We do need to use them, but sometimes they can be a bit reductive. So think about planning for craft. You can do that is by using some of these more challenging devices, imperatives, direct address, pronouns, particularly inclusive pronouns like we, hyperbole. Also, don't underestimate the importance of using things like metaphors and personification and similes and things in this style of writing. They can be really effective as well, particularly in like your drop paragraphs and things like that. Vocabulary is probably the one area that can lift your writing more than any other. So if I was going to give you some advice, it would be to sharpen your vocabulary and to really work on improving the range of words that you've got at your disposal. One of the things that is in your pack is this audit of vocabulary. This is called um, 100 words to sharpen your expression. It was originally made for students working towards an A star, but it's equally relevant to all of you now. This has 100 words used in sentences, and I would absolutely encourage you to select five or more words that you think that's a great word. I'm going to start including that in my writing. I'm going to try and use words like uh, cynical. I'm going to try and use words like callous. I'm going to try and use words like infamy. I'm going to try and use words like uh, oblivious, for instance. This is the key as well to absolutely brilliant writing. OK, so a couple of things that you need to take away. Next step, you've got your pack of resources and exam tasks now that you can use at home for revision. Your teacher is going to build on all of this in your lessons, particularly as we begin to write, revise paper two ahead of the summer. Um, and you're going to practice each one of those exam skills plenty more. But you've done brilliantly so far on your mark. And I really want to congratulate you on how well you've done so far. Remember, success is a science. If you have the conditions, you will get the results. You absolutely can revise for English. It is all about practice and it is all about sharpening those skills. Well done, Year 11.